In July 2019, an unprecedented scandal erupted in Romania, demonstrating how the police respond to calls to the emergency service. The call to number 112 was received on July 25th at 11.05. The caller, a 15-year-old schoolgirl named Alexandra Masisanu, struggling to speak, told the operator that she had been kidnapped, beaten, assaulted, and was being held against her will in some house. She didn't know where she was, but only knew that she was in the city of Caracal. Before the call was interrupted, the operator sarcastically asked how they would find her if she didn't tell them her location. Fortunately, Alexandra called again at 11.06, and the operator once again tried to ascertain her location. The girl managed to provide important details. For example, she had seen a dam before the kidnapper blindfolded her eyes. He had a gray car, and she was being held in a very old, dilapidated house near a gas station. There was a lot of grass and bushes in the yard, as well as two dogs. She even mentioned a name and an address that she read from a business card she found, and explained that she was calling from the kidnapper's phone. The operator relayed the situation to a police officer who continued to communicate with the girl. He told her to stay where she was, because they were sending a team. Alexandra tried to provide more description of the kidnapper's car in the yard, but the police officer wasn't listening anymore. The schoolgirl called again at 11.12 and asked if they had sent anyone to help her. Another police officer replied irritably that the team had already been dispatched but couldn't reach her in two minutes. Alexandra begged the police officer to stay on the line with her because she was terrified, but he responded that they had other calls to attend to. The team will arrive in two or three minutes, what the hell, he added. The girl reluctantly agreed. Although the emergency services personnel knew that the kidnapper was supposed to return any minute, they inexplicably called Alexandra nine more times, but no one answered. Not surprisingly, even if the girl had initially tried to discreetly place the phone back, the kidnapper now knew for certain that she had called the police. Twelve hours after Alexandra's call, the police finally brought her father to the station, allowed him to listen to the emergency call, and asked if he recognized his daughter's voice. When the man confirmed that it was her voice, they believed it was not a prank, and only then did they begin their investigation. Unfortunately, the name on the business card Alexandra found belonged to a man who had no connection to the case, and the specialized telecommunications service couldn't trace the origin of the call. Technicians were able to provide the officers with a very wide search radius and three possible locations for the girl, but none of the specified locations were correct. At that point, the police turned to surveillance camera recordings to identify a vehicle involved in a similar case. Once they identified the driver, they surrounded his house. Despite not being legally required, the police applied for a warrant and simply waited. They received the warrant at 6 in the morning on July 26th, a staggering 19 hours after Alexandra's call. Only then did they knock on the suspect's house gate. Of course, they were late. Inside the house, they found Alexandra's clothes and jewelry in the car, the girl's earring, and in the yard, a metallic barrel with ashes and human remains. The man stated that he doesn't know any Alexandru Mashishano, and the ashes in the barrel remained after the fire he lit to defend himself from persistent mosquitoes. However, after a thorough examination of the barrel's contents, investigators found six teeth. The results of the laboratory analysis left no room for doubt. The teeth belonged to Alexandra. The police arrested the homeowner, 66-year-old Gerga Dinka, a retired mechanic. Neighbors knew Gyorga as an aggressive and inhumane person. So inhumane that he had a special code for his rare visitors. Three knocks on the door. He suffered from antisocial personality disorder, had been admitted to a mental institution five times, and his troubled childhood could have been a possible reason for his condition. Gyorga's father worked as a butcher engaging in illegal meat trade, often killing and butchering animals in front of his son, forcing the boy to assist. This soon became routine, and Gyorga himself was already killing stray animals for his twisted pleasure. 
His father was a heavy drinker and frequently beat the boy, using belts, brooms, and even the hose from the washing machine multiple times a day. He also tied his son up with a wire to prevent him from going outside to play with other kids. Interestingly, later on, Georga started treating his own victims the same way. Not surprisingly, the boy performed poorly in school. However, when he joined the army, it seemed like his life was getting on track, and he found his place, until he assaulted another soldier who turned out to be the son of a defense ministry official. Expelled from the army, Georga returned home and got a job as a general laborer at a hospital. He worked there for eight years before attempting to find work on construction sites in Italy. Once again, things didn't work out, as he was fired after brutally beating an Albanian worker. After attacking a young woman, he was deported from the country. Upon returning to Romania, he worked as a mechanic, drove taxis, and also collected and sold scrap metal. Despite his inhumane behavior and reclusiveness, he managed to start a family and became the father of four children. His wife, tired of his constant abuse, lived and worked in Italy. Sources close to Gheorghe say that when his wife came to Romania for the last time, he severely beat her. All four children left their father's house. Three sons chose to live with their mother, while the daughter settled in Timisoara. After George's arrest, she insisted that she had no contact with her father, whom she considered mentally unstable. So, as it appears, Georga Dinka was a recluse, living in isolation, and his behavioral issues couldn't resolve on their own. Another shocking piece of news shocked the public. Georga confessed to the murder of the second girl, whom he abducted in April, two months prior to Alexandra's kidnapping. The second victim of the man was an 18-year-old named Luisa Melenku. Until the age of 12, Luisa lived in Italy with her mother, Monica Melenku, who worked there and engaged in vegetable cultivation. However, in search of a better life and income, Monica moved to the United Kingdom, while Louisa chose to finish school in her homeland and lived with her grandparents. She dedicated a lot of time to her studies and was determined to get an excellent education to find a job with a decent salary to support her family. But she relied on her mother's support for the time being. On April 14th, her mother sent her money for sports shoes. Louisa went to an ATM in Caracal, but for some reason, she couldn't withdraw money. She called her grandfather to let him know she was on her way home and headed to the bus stop. However, since it was Sunday and public transportation was scarce, especially in rural areas where locals often complained about its unreliability even on weekdays, Louisa decided to hitchhike. Unfortunately, Georga Dinka was passing by. He agreed to give her a ride. Louisa struck up a conversation and told him about her failed attempt to get money from the ATM. Upon hearing this, Georga offered her 30 lei, approximately $7, for intimate services. She refused, after which Georga decided to take what he wanted by force. Meanwhile, Louisa's grandfather began to worry because he knew his granddaughter should have been home by now. He called her mobile phone, but she didn't answer. Recognizing this behavior as entirely out of character, he rushed to the police station to report her disappearance. However, the officers dismissed his concerns, attributing Louisa's absence to a potential romantic involvement. Left with no choice, Louisa's family started searching for her themselves, and her classmates spread information about her disappearance on social media. The next day, an unidentified man called Louisa's grandfather, assuring him that Louisa was fine but didn't want to talk to him. He added that they were planning to go to Switzerland together. Not believing a word of the stranger's claim, the grandfather made multiple attempts to contact the police but received no assistance. Louisa's mother, Monica, traveled from the UK where she had been living and working and had somewhat better luck with the police. Only on the fourth day did the police begin an investigation which seemed more like mockery of the relatives. Louisa's grandfather was subjected to a polygraph test because they suspected him of withholding information. Finally, on May 30th, the case was handed over to the Directorate for Investigating Organized Crime and Terrorism, DCOT, which announced the opening of a criminal case on June 6th. They decided to investigate Louisa's disappearance as a human trafficking case, as they saw signs that she might have been recruited against her will for sexual exploitation. DCOT continued their investigation when news broke about the disappearance of another girl, Alexandra Mashishanu. A 15-year-old teenager from Dobro, Slovenia, was a student in the 10th grade at one of the top schools in Karakal. On July 24th, Alexandra left her home at 10 o'clock in the morning to meet a friend from Karakal. No one else saw her after that. The girl's parents quickly turned to the police, but the officers did not take their concerns seriously, stating that she was old enough to go out with friends and lose track of time. They advised them to wait. 
When the truth about the two murders came to light, the criminal inaction and negligence of officials and law enforcement personnel triggered a massive political crisis in the country. Many government bodies tried to demonstrate their activity, showing that they were doing their job, but it did not help them. The Minister of the Interior, the head of the criminal police, the director of the rescue service, the police leadership, and the prosecution in Caracal were all dismissed. The Prime Minister dismissed the Minister of Education, who cynically remarked that young girls should think twice before getting into strangers' cars, as if she were unaware of the problems with public transportation in the country and the fact that hitchhiking is sometimes the only way to travel in small towns. The police claimed that the special telecommunications service employees could not provide more precise information about the origins of the calls, leading to their search efforts being focused in the wrong places. However, the police were also criticized for their slow and chaotic response. Frustrated, the grandfather of Louisa labeled them as criminals being paid by the government to not do their job. At the same time, questions arose about the remains of the murdered girls. Here is where the most significant mystery of this story begins. Georga stated that he burned the bodies. He scattered fragments of Louisa's bones in the forest and disposed of her clothes. However, he did not have time to do the same with Alexandra's clothes and body. Investigators reconstructed the crime scenes. Georga was asked to guide the investigators step by step to all the places he had been on the days of the deaths of Louisa and Alexandra. At this point, he started to contradict himself in his statements, allegedly struggling to remember what he did at the time. According to criminologists, Georga intentionally led them on a wild goose chase. Although he confessed to the two murders he was asked about, when he was requested to repeat his actions during the crimes and show where he left the remains, he panicked. This might be because he probably had a secret location where he hid all his victims. As there were likely more than two bodies in that hidden place, he led the investigators on a wild goose chase, pretending to be confused, not understanding and not remembering anything. Although fragments of bones were found in the forest, experts believed that the bodies were either in the Danube or the Olt River. In November 2019, while in prison, Georga began to write a confession detailing what he had done to Luisa and Alexandra. He started his account with the incident on April 14th, when he stopped his car as Louise was hitchhiking on the road. He agreed to give her a ride and engaged in conversation with her during the journey. He realized that he was becoming sexually aroused. His thoughts were consumed by nothing else but fulfilling his own desires. The man offered the girl 30 Romanian lei, about $7, for intimate services. When she declined, he struck her in the face and bound her with a belt. Interestingly, Georga also blindfolded her so that the victim wouldn't know the way to his house. Does this imply that he intended to release her alive? After parking the car at his house, the man noticed his 36-year-old neighbor, Stefan Rapeziano, in the yard. Stefan occasionally helped Georga clean up the yard. Seeing a beautiful young girl in the car, Stefan asked who she was. With no other option, Georga said that he brought her for intimate services, and the neighbor asked to join him. Georga agreed. The men subjected Louise to humiliation and continued to torment her for four days. On the morning of the fourth day, Georga lost his temper when the girl tried to resist him for the last time. He violently beat her and left her in a pool of blood on the bed, briefly stepping out to feed otters. When he returned, it was already too late to help the girl. The man didn't panic. He placed her in a metallic barrel and set it on fire, covering it with plastic and cardboard. Then, he went to sleep. When he woke up, he collected the ashes and fragments of bones and scattered them along the border of the nearby forest. Georga's account of what happened to Alexandra was even more sinister. On July 24th, two months after Louise's murder, he noticed the same girl hitchhiking on the road again. Even though he was driving in the opposite direction, he turned the car around and offered her a ride. The story repeated itself. He offered Alexandra 50 lei for intimate services, and upon her refusal, he abducted her. He brought the bound girl to his home, immediately tying her to the bed and subjecting her to violence. The next day, at six in the morning, Georga was drinking coffee while his victim lay tied to the bed. The girl complained of a terrible headache and said she needed a painkiller. Georga suggested going to buy some medication. Before leaving, he additionally tied her with ropes, wires, and a chain. In addition to the medication, he bought a prepaid card to call Alexandra's mother. Inserting it into the girl's mobile phone, he called her mother and claimed to be Alexandra's boyfriend, assuring her that everything was fine. Then he discarded the phone. The phone was later found, and some children played with it. 
The man returned home around noon. He saw that Alexandra had freed herself and was wandering around the house with his mobile phone. He struck her several times, causing her to fall and hit her head on the concrete floor, resulting in her death. The man wrapped the body in bedsheets, placed some wooden planks and chips, and a two-liter bottle of Vaseline in a barrel and set it on fire. On top, he threw a thick cardboard. He also threw his mobile phone there. Then he went to sleep. He woke up early in the morning to the barking of dogs, as police were banging on his door. Despite the man's confession and the results of the DNA analysis, the families of Alexandra and Luisa refused to believe that Georga killed the girls. And the matter was not only in the reluctance of the relatives to believe that they are no longer alive. In fact, there was reason to suspect Georga of human trafficking and that the girls weren't killed but were sold for exploitation. First of all, in favor of this version is the fact that human trafficking is a very common phenomenon in Romania. Additionally, in 2022, Georga recanted his confession. He confirmed that he kidnapped and mistreated Alexandra and Luisa, but then handed them over to a local criminal boss who sent the girls to a brothel in Turkey. The police allegedly protect this boss, so they tortured Georga and forced him to take the blame for the murder, and they planted Alexandra's teeth themselves. The man's story seems far-fetched if it weren't for some facts. It's unclear why George didn't immediately try to dispose of Alexandra's body, knowing that she had called the police from his phone. Instead of that, he slowly cremated her body for a long eight hours. Moreover, the burning of an entire human body should produce a very unpleasant smell and smoke. However, the man's neighbors didn't notice any smoke, smell, or anything unusual. The way Georga behaved during the abductions shows that he knew step by step how to act. He knew how to select victims of a specific appearance, and the act of abduction itself seemed standardized. The series of potential crimes was only interrupted when Alexandra pulled him out of this familiar routine by calling the police. Furthermore, investigators speculated that Georga might have had accomplices. The point is, right after the girls' disappearances, unknown individuals called both families several times, assuring them that the girls were all right. At least two of these calls were made by Georga, but Alexandra's mother and Luisa's grandfather are convinced that two people were calling them. This argument that Georga might have had accomplices prompted not only Romanian police, but also the FBI, Eurojust, and Italy's main anti-mafia agency to get involved in the investigation. Additionally, it seemed to the relatives that the prosecution intentionally prolonged the case. In particular, the prosecutor received video material that indicated Georga's car was connected to Luisa's abduction. But the prosecutor never summoned him for questioning or ordered a search of his car or home. After Alexandra's disappearance until July 27th, he didn't share the surveillance camera footage, which captured Georga's car. Even then, he only showed them a single frame from the video, where the car's license plate wasn't visible. Also, on July 27th, after searching the man's house, another accuser not only claimed that Alexandra was killed on that night, but also that strangulation was the cause of her death. However, how could he know this without the victim's body? Georga hadn't made a confession yet. And finally, the most intriguing argument in favor of the possibility that the man might have been involved in human trafficking is that his daughter, Daniela Dinky, assured investigators and the media that she wanted nothing to do with her father and didn't communicate with him. But it turned out to be a lie. She did communicate with her father, and she has a criminal record herself. A few years ago, she was accused of connections to human trafficking networks. Following this, another revelation came in the story. Georga Dinka's son, Dan, was once involved in a group assault and escaped punishment only due to his father's intervention. Allegedly, Georga had connections within the police and the prosecutor's office. The victim was persuaded to withdraw her statement and the case was kept confidential. Equally important in this case is the question of whether Georga's list of victims could be longer. Two girls were abducted under similar circumstances when trying to hitchhike and they resembled each other in appearance. This points to a characteristic modus operandi of the criminal, relying on chance and showing an interest in a specific type of appearance. The man's inclination to commit crimes might partly be explained by his suffering from antisocial personality disorder. This condition is characterized by a constant pursuit of pleasure and satisfaction, as well as a lack of empathy, respect for the feelings, needs, or suffering of others, and a lack of remorse after offending or causing harm to another person. Some individuals suffering from this condition cannot form close relationships 
and use dominance and intimidation to control others. In this context, all the elements of the puzzle come together to form a coherent picture, but what's surprising is Georga's age, 66 years old. Criminals with a similar diagnosis usually evolve into violent killers during their youth. This disorder remains with a person throughout their life and doesn't appear and then diminish like other mental disorders. In other words, it's rare for a man to suddenly kill two girls with a two-month gap at the age of 66. Georga most likely committed other heinous crimes in the past. It's unlikely that Alexandra and Louise were his only victims. Very unlikely. Georga was charged with human trafficking, trafficking of minors, two cases of assault, two murders, and two cases of desecration of bodies. But he wasn't planning on surrendering so easily. Dubbed the Caracal Monster, he attempted to sue Romania in the European Court of Human Rights, pointing to a lack of evidence and claiming that he was treated unfairly during his arrest. He fought for a long time, but ultimately lost. On September 23rd, the 69-year-old Georga was sentenced to the maximum possible punishment, 30 years of imprisonment. The thing is, for all the charges brought against him, he should have received 108 years in prison. But for individuals over the age of 65, the maximum punishment is considered to be 30 years. He is also obligated to pay compensation of 700,000 euros to the victim's relatives. The neighbor of the man, Stefan Rapeziano, was sentenced to seven years in prison for his involvement in the violence. In March 2023, Georga once again caught the public's attention by declaring that he had repented and found God. He stated that he was able to forget and leave behind the entire ordeal. In contrast to him, the victim's relatives will never be able to forget what happened. 